be bigger. So I've never done this before. I'm on Streamlabs, so it doesn't look like anybody else is with me just now, but uh, hopefully people will find this and will join uh, very soon. So, ah, suddenly we have people. Do let me know, can you see me? Can you hear me? That would be uh, most useful to, uh, to know as I'm using Streamlabs for the very first time. So uh, it says there's 11 of you, so I'm hoping you can see me, you can hear me. Is there anybody out there? Eight people. And I want to lost three people before we even started. So do let me know uh, if there is any issue. I'll back up to 11, it's saying, but uh, I'm not getting any chat through. So uh, maybe I have, um, oh, have I accidentally done something wrong in the settings and got rid of the chat? Uh, it may well be, where are we? Um, it may well be um, that I've messed up and deleted the chat function, um, <laughs> which isn't ideal, but it's the first time I've used it. So uh, hopefully the video and the audio are good. Um, I'm going to pretend that I think what your questions will be and ask them. Uh, I think I've done something wrong in the settings, but um, hopefully you can all see me and hear me and I'm not just talking. It says there's 16 people on here, so uh, 15 now. Going up, going down. Um, so it does look like there are people there, but for whatever, I was, I was advised to delete the screens. I think I may well have deleted the chat function uh, at the same time, but um, never mind. We will uh, we will proceed as if you're all able to contribute, and um, I'll try and anticipate any questions you might have had and answer them all for you. So uh, I'm sorry if that uh, is the situation today, but uh, we live and learn. Um, we're all getting used to um, this kind of this new world of of YouTubing, and um, you know. I had one very good experience on, on YouTube and then one below par last weekend. So uh, I'm kind of following the advice to try these stream labs, but uh, there isn't much by way of um, kind of information. So um, I'm just seeing if I can see anything. But no, I, I can see there's 20 people on, but as I say, if there's no chat, I apologize. I will work that out in t in ahead of the next. Um, live and um, hopefully we'll just have a nice walk around town it's, it's very wet today anyway so there was actually a danger of cancelling this tour so um, if it ends up being very very wet make it cut short so uh, it isn't necessarily the end of the world so uh, so don't worry but hopefully the 20 of you that are on you can give me some feedback afterwards as to obviously i can tell you can't chat because there's no chat coming through so i've obviously disabled something um that maybe i can look at but um What if I, I think, to do that? No, it's not going to let me. So I do apologise if um, if it's slightly frustrating that you can't see, but um, do stay with us, and uh, I'll do my very best to uh, to bring you the best experience, albeit an experience without chat. It looks like today. So, uh, I can't see either what time it is. Uh, I think I went live um, about 18 minutes past, so I think we have to go to about 12, or just if I can find any sort of time to, uh, to get. As you can see here, in York today, it is rather wet, so uh, we're going to have to do a bit, make, make the best of it, as you might say. So, uh, I hope you're all well. Hopefully, some of you enjoying the coronation earlier, for those who are interested. Hasn't happened for 70 years, so uh, it's not a common or garden event. So uh, it was good that they were all able to, to choose whether to partake in that particular form of pageantry, entertainment, history, call it what you will. 
Um, it was good to see. So I'm just going to see if I can find a clock because I'm singularly disadvantaged right now by uh, by not being able to, to see a time run here. Merely the time that went live, of course, would be today that I didn't put a watch on. But uh, never mind, these things are sent to testers and uh, we're not going to let it hold us back. Not today. So uh, I'm just going to see if I can find what the right time is, then at least I can I can watch the clock that is ticking down and know when it is scheduled for half past five, which is when we were, we were due to go live. So I think there's a clock on this bus stop, so we're going to have a look at that. So I've got a very latent hands-free umbrella, <laughs> strapped best as I can to... Uh, let's see, is it... 17.25, okay, so we'll go five, five minutes and then we'll go live. So uh, as I say, for those who just joined, my apologies if the chat function has been disabled. Um, it is my first go using this Streamlab, which we're all trying to see if it'll get over those problems with um, signal issues. Um, and so far, people's experience has been very positive. Other guides, uh, we were on a sort of shared meeting, a um, meeting of the, the collective the other evening, and about six or seven of my colleagues all said that having experienced problems just doing YouTube Live, they got onto this and uh, it was infinitely better. But uh, as I say, I've clearly messed up a bit somewhere in the settings. Um, and so we haven't got a chat function by looks things today. So I do apologize about that. And uh, if there are any questions um, in relation to today's tour, do feel free to drop them in my uh, Facebook group, which is All Points North with John. And uh, I'll pick them up afterwards and I can answer them there. So I apologize. I don't know what I've done. In fact, I don't know what I'm doing, if I'm being honest. We were somewhat spoilt uh, by Hagen. Um, some of this stuff was kind of easy once you got used to it. Um, but of course, we're starting from the bottom up again. But uh, the good news is we're still here, aren't we? So uh, I think that we can hopefully put up with a few bumps in the road on route to Utopia, which of course is a world where guys get to keep 100% of the income you give them. There is no Mr. 40%. So uh, that's what we're walking towards. And so uh, it'll, it'll be a few highways and byways and deviations that we uh, have to talk before we actually get it 100% but uh, do bear with us through this kind of learning and uh, go go and obviously support as many of the guys as you can so I'm going to say three minutes till we go live okay so we'll go live that's so about 10 o'clock um so my apologies as I say for the lack of chat but uh, hopefully I can be chatty enough for all of us and we can do our best to get around York the walls without getting too wet it is a uh, Suggest we're going to have a downpour, so it may well be that I have to curtail this tour and cut it short. So uh, we'll, we'll have to be guided by, by the weather, uh, which I think is always a kind of sensible precaution anyway. So uh, we are about two minutes before I'm due to go live. And so I'm going to work myself into a kind of position. Okay, that's all right, doing that. So I hope you're all well, and uh, as I say, I can see there are 34 on this stream, um, and I hope that I can, uh, I can royally entertain you on this day of comedy. See what I did there? Royally entertain you? Sorry about that. But uh, nonetheless, with nobody else to talk to, I'm going to have to, uh, have to amuse myself today and, uh, and do what I think feels like the right thing to do. So we're about a minute till we, I think, officially hit our our scheduled time so uh, let me get into the position assume the position as they say before we go for a little walk on the walls so uh, if anybody hasn't seen me before uh, my name's John I have a Facebook group called All Points North with John and uh, I cover across the north of England um, based in York so the majority of my content is York and the York area but uh, I do go further afield so do give me a follow um, on the Facebook group to, uh, to kind of find out where I'm going. Now, you might ask, what's the, the monument behind me? Or to, just over my shoulder, it's a Boer War monument of York. There's several Boer War monuments. So that's this obviously commemorating losses in the, the war in South Africa between 1899 and 1902, which was basically um, the British Army rather humiliated fighting against a bunch of South African farmers. Um, and they found that kind of the terrain didn't really suit them their weaponry wasn't great, the Brits, um, but they invented 
some of the things that came to define the 20th century. Firstly, trench warfare began not in the First World War, but in the Boer War in South Africa. And secondly, concentration camps were invented by the British. And so the Germans in the early 30s took an idea invented by us, but of course took it to horrifying levels. But um, the Boer War famous, and khaki as well, uh, prior to and the Boer War, the British Army went into battle wearing bright red tunics. After the Boer War, they realised that that was uh, rather daft, and so they started wearing desert coloured uniforms. So I believe we have hit our scheduled live time. Um, to everyone who's on here, I can only apologise for the lack of chat. Um, it is, I'm afraid, because I've goofed up on this new thing called Streamlabs. It's a historic day today, obviously, my first go at Streamlabs, but also, of course, because it is the date of the coronation. So I thought we would start here, by the Royal Castle in York. So over the other side, we'd have trouble sort of crossing. And um, the Royal Castle is the first castle, um, sorry, the first castle uh, built by a monarch. It was built, firstly, by the Norman King William I, William the Conqueror. Now he built a wooden castle here, Obviously, what we're going to do is a stone castle. And at the coronation today, you'll have heard, no doubt, for those who are in tune, that it was the 40th monarch since William I. The 40th king, England, Great Britain, United Kingdom. And it's not strictly true, because, of course, the Normans never invaded Scotland. So, actually, the Act of Union, which dates from 1707, I would ask if anybody knows, but you can't answer on chat, so that was under Queen Anne. So actually, he's the 13th monarch to be king since the Act of Union, in effect, created the United, king, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So um, he is obviously monarch of England, of Scotland, the Stone was losing. So William the Conqueror wasn't that. So to say he's the 40th is kind of misleading. And also, William wasn't the first. He was the 62nd king of England. So it really does depend on how you do your history. But most people sort of talk about monarchy and history as being from 1066 because of this dramatic event, the Norman conquest of England. But it's fair to say that York was not conquered in, in 1066. It took a great deal longer because York was the home of the Viking kingdom of Jorvik. And so the kings of Northumbria had given way to Viking overlords. And so it wasn't a simple matter of simply saying, at the end of the Battle of Hastings, it was job done. William had to piece by piece conquer the rest of the country. Now some um, surrendered to him, Bert Campstead in October of 1066. But other places, including the Kingdom of Jorvik, Northumbria, fought on. And it was to take William a further three years to fully consolidate his hold across the north. He stayed here in Christmas 1069 to celebrate finally conquering York Kingdom, the north. And from that point onwards, he had a cemented hold across the entire country. You see the rain kind of coming down here, perhaps, but uh, let's just take a moment to, to get a shot. York's River, the River Ouse. And of course, the river was incredibly important in terms of transportation. Not least because 40 miles in that direction is the Humber Estuary, the North Sea. And 300 miles further, you're at Denmark, the bottom of Scandinavia. So for the Vikings, this was practically a day trip. They'd been here for 200 years, so it wasn't simply a case of defeating one Viking army, and that was job done. More reinforcements inevitably would come. William knew that if he was going to hold the north of England, hold all of England, he had to control York. And so his strategy was to build two castles. One we've just seen up on the mound there. The mound does actually date from the period of William the Conqueror. The second um, castle he built is in front of us. We've got to see the site of that castle. It no longer exists, but the mound that was built by the Normans does. And the idea was to build a castle on either side of the river. From there, you could hang great chains through the river and you could close off access to both the river and, of course, the North Sea. So, what in effect they were doing was closing the gates 
on the Vikings, the Viking longships that had been here in York, who destroyed the Battle of Stamford Bridge, or largely destroyed the Battle of Stamford Bridge, could no longer gain access to the city. And that really was the end of the period of Viking occupation of the city. York, from that point onwards, becomes part of England for the first time under William. And the protection of the city meant the rebuilding of the walls that had first been built by the Romans, been reinforced by the Vikings. Now work began to create permanent sets of stone fortifications around the city of York. And we are walking a section of those walls. So we're starting here at Bailey Hill. So Bailey Hill is uh, the location of the second of the castles here in York. And it's worth saying that it's a Bailey Hill, that's how it's spelled. It's a Bale Hill. So it's worth mentioning that other than London, York was the only place where William built two castles. So such was the importance of York. It was the only place that warranted a second castle. So it gives you an idea of status and that obviously starting from the Romans onwards, certainly into the Vikings, York is treated as the de facto capital of the North. So it is a big deal to take and to hold York but William had no interest, he wanted to rule from London. So what he decided to do was something that would be seen today as a war crime, basically. He set about destroying the North, to lay waste to it, to burn it to the ground, not simply its buildings, but also its fields, its quays, its jetties, preventing people from landing boats here, from feeding armies here. This is the site of Bailey Hill Castle, at the top of this mound, was the second castle of York. What's called the Harrowing of the North in 1069, we think led to the death of somewhere in the region of 20,000 people. So such was the importance and the threat of the North, and of course, by just an extension of the Vikings, that um, consequently, um, it... Uh, it made sense to William to burn the thing to the ground. But of course, he then had huge problems with his conscience. What does one do? How does one atone for not merely the Battle of Hastings, while at death, and also the harrowing of the North? William was ordered penance. And so the way he was able to deal with his penance, a penance basically is the amount of prayers he would have to do for each death, would have lasted when they reached 1,400 years. So he would still be praying today. But William wanted a shortcut, and so he got people to do the praying for him, he founded the Benedictine Monastery at York, St Mary's Abbey, in the museum gardens here, to, uh, to enable that prayer to be done on his behalf. So uh, that's what William did, and so he was able to, by the end of his reign, on his deathbed, he sort of felt that he probably just about got over the line and there'd be a place for him in heaven. Now, there's recently been some renovation work done on the wall seat. You can just see now some new grip surfacing here. And it's opened out a section that hasn't been previously exposed for well, quite literally centuries. And there's a nice interpretation board here. So for those that like to get a strong visual sense, here is an artist's representation of essentially the two castles. So the one here we just left a moment ago in Clifford's Tower where we started on the tour. And you can see with the fortifications how it's very, very easy to kind of close off and control access to the river um, that way. So you've got the rudiments then of a walled city. At this stage you can see it is uh, like a sort of colonial fort style. So it's kind of made of wood. Um, but of course, you know, that eventually would become stone fortifications. So under the Normans, by the 11th century, you've got this idea of you know, a walled city, a continuation but an expansion on what the Romans had done. Another illustration over here. Again, we can see these wooden fortifications, so kind of tree trunks cut, sharpened at the top, um, allowing us the vantage point. So when we look down here, and it's all beautiful in stone, originally it's really wooden ramparts with earthworks. The Roman and Viking walls are below us in the, in, in the earthworks. So this sits atop, if you like. So we've got walls that date all the way back. But what's nice is now we can 
have a look and peer in and we can sort of see the construction side of things of, uh, of the tower. So I say this has all been exposed and opened up in the last, I would say, six months maybe, somewhere in that region. And this, I say two nice interpretation boards put here. So uh, our next stop on the walls is in front of us here. And you're able to see a kind of circular section. And it is known as Beach Daughter Tower. It's a rather unfortunate name. Um, but it's not related to a stroppy team. It is believed to be from the French daughters from Dormir to sleep, especially nightmare bedroom. This was the king's cell, the king's prison. High up on the walls, people that displeased the monarch could expect to spend time up here, cold, isolated. Um, so, nightmare bedroom, beach daughter tower, um, dates from at least the early part of the 14th century. That's our earliest kind of references to it. And uh, it would have been a jolly cold and unpleasant place to be locked up. So uh, let's just wait for these two guys to go around. So I hope that you can see me and hear me okay. I'll find out obviously afterwards with the video what I've done, what I've gone wrong. So I do apologize about the lack of chat. Uh, but as I say, I'll just try and do a chat for you. So that's is a, the, the increasingly well known Bishy Road area. Just hoping to interview to our kind of left hand side, very fashionable area with artisan cafes and bakeries and restaurants and pubs and kind of nightlife. Um, Yorkie's becoming very much, I would say, well, always has been, I suppose, two cities insofar as the villages, but in terms of the city centre around here where we are, is booming, very expensive, very affluent, kind of middle class, um, very wealthy, professional. Other parts of York are very much kind of falling behind. So, very much a kind of tale of two cities, but it always was. There's never been a time where York has been, if you like, a centre of uh, equal wealth. It has always had the wealthy and indeed the super wealthy um, and of course York was a magnet for the super wealthy because you could make money here um, and the walls have two real functions really firstly of course they are defensive we'll talk about that as we kind of walk along but secondly there is a civic importance to them having a sense of importance a sense of arrival there were very few imposing medieval walled cities so when you've done your two or three days walk with your animals, coming to market maybe, or coming to buy cloth, you'd get a clear sense on arrival that this was a place of importance, of tradition, of history, of majesty. It was a royal city, appropriately for today. We're going to see Michael get by in a moment, the place of greeting the monarchs. But you can see how it kind of gave gravitas that people would no doubt arrive here and uh, would be able to be really kind of clear that this was a place of importance, a place of significance, a place of wealth. And um, so I think it still gives that feeling to say a lot of people, if they can, they've still got the, uh, the mobility, will make a beeline for a walk on the walls whilst they're here because it provides a kind of unique way of seeing the city. They kind of obviously carve the city into that which is within the walls and that which is outside. And there's a lot of York outside the walls and there always was. It was never a case of the city boundaries were defined by the walls, merely that you had a place of safety, of refuge, where you could come, where you could uh, be protected in times of danger and in times of war. Um, but of course, where now we look at the internal uh, part of the city and we see all the kind of small alleyways and the, the medieval buildings and everything, I think how cute it all looks. Back in the medieval era, era, it would have been very cramped, very crowded, far too many people living in kind of small sort of spaces. So our sort of perception now of what is aesthetically pleasing isn't necessarily representative of the experience of living here in years gone by. What's certain is it was, it was a thriving metropolis. It was a place to come and make money, and trade, and manufacturing, particularly in uh, textiles and cloth and wool. There was a, a very, very thriving wool market here. And um, so York was important for all sorts of reasons. So the first kind of reason 
um, was its location. I'm just going to go down and show you Victoria Bar. This is the last of the gateways opened up in York. And uh, there was a very serious proposition at one time to take the walls down because we're kind of getting in the way. There was far too few gateways for a thriving commercial city you need access, ingress for people, for goods, for raw materials, finished goods, in and out. And uh, the walls weren't really providing that. So there was definitely a call to bring them down was growing. But before that, they decided to try and open up some new gateways. So this is the last of the gateways, the Victoria Bar. And Victoria Bar was, uh, was built to commemorate, of course, the ascension of Queen Victoria, who would be, what would she be, the great, great grandmother? Would she have, uh, I can't remember how many greats, but anyway, of course she, she is, so you've got Victoria, Edward the Seventh, George the Fifth, George the Sixth, Elizabeth. So five monarchs before Charles, they opened up Victoria Bar in, uh, in 1838. So she, she became queen in 1837, so the year after this was kind of opened up. So it was always about kind of making the, the walls more accessible. They kind of decided they were gonna keep them, but uh, they had to work for people for business and so forth, for commerce. And so he decided to open up more of the gateways. So uh, that's why Victoria Bar is here. So it's not one of the medieval gateways, it was added considerably later. So back up onto the walls to our, our next section. And I'm just gonna take a drink. Uh. Mm. <sighs> So we're walking up towards Micklegate Bar, and uh, I think as we do, it's very easy for us looking at these sort of stretches to imagine the life of the guards, patrolling these spaces, walking along backwards and forwards, because of course, a city's defences is only as good as the vigilance of its watchmen. They were the, quite literally the eyes and the ears. Now, if we look, obviously, at the defensive system, it is pretty robust. You can see the slope runs a long, long way down at the bottom of here, where the car park is, where there once been a moat surrounding it, so you had another form of defence. But even so, of course, particularly under the cover of darkness, it was relatively possible to stage attacks. So it was the duty of the watchman to stay awake, alert, in all weathers, looking out for anybody that could be trying to breach the security of York. So such was the importance and the onus put on this job. There were some horrible punishments meted out to guards who would forget and fall asleep, or weren't paying attention. And the penalty was that you'd be put into a wicker basket, a large wicker basket, and by a rope dangled over the edge here, ready to fall down into the moat. Now you see where the cars, that was the moat at the bottom there. And unfortunately the moat was like a public sewer. So all the nasties went into the moat. So it's a pretty, it was a pretty good way of keeping people away from the walls, right? So the moat is pretty disgusting. So you are dangled over the moat in a whisker bas wicker basket, suspended by a rope, and you're given a knife. So at some point, either you're gonna die of starvation or you're gonna cut the rope and you're gonna plunge into the freezing cold swamp of, of raw sewage. If you don't drown or die, shock and hypothermia, or perhaps septicemia a few days, three days later, poisoning, then if you could make it, you were then outlawed for a year and a day, which meant being sent from the city, you're banished, you could receive no help, no support, anybody helping you, would similarly be banished. So be an outlaw, it's be outside the law, meaning you had no protection, no support, no access to justice. You couldn't live within a town or a village. In effect, it was as close to a death sentence as was possible. So we've taken the word outlaw now to mean someone, you know, kind of like a cowboy, really, you know, Western film, that kind of outlaw. Um, but it was a good deal more uh, serious being able to survive as an outlaw was incredibly difficult. And of course, if you were then to venture into a village, try and get food, if you're caught, you have your hands cut off, 
your feet cut off, you're branded, your tongue taken out, all manner of horrible things would happen to you. So it really was an incredibly tough sentence. So it really did to stay awake on those long nights patrolling up and down, up and down on the walls of York. So today, of course, being the day of the coronation of King Charles III, Queen Camilla, appropriate day to talk about York's royal entrance. And those of you who may have joined me on Hago, I actually visited um, Micklegate Bar uh, about three months ago to greet the arrival of King Charles on his first visit to York. And King Charles is maybe the latest in the line of monarchs that visited York. In fact, every single monarch since William the Conqueror's William I, 1066 to 1087, have come and visited York. And they've all arrived at the same place, the gateway on the London Road. So the road that leads out from Micklegate Bar, the old A64, will eventually join on to the A1, the Great North-South Road. And so anybody coming from the south, which is generally speaking where the royals would be located, would come to yours and years old when William the Conqueror and his party first came here in 1068. And so when Charles came here um, late last year, or early this year, I forget which, he was the 40th monarch to visit and they all arrive in the same place. Since the 13th century, when, the, when this gateway was built, they've passed on this gateway, but of course, previously, it would be wooden ramparts, but in the same location. This being the south entrance of the city of York, a Micklegate bar, which is known as Micklegate, Mickle meaning great, so Great Street. Yeah, I'll let yeah, these yeah, folk yeah. get past. And, uh, that's just coming in front of us, allow this folk to pass. So the building, you just see the turrets coming into view now, I would imagine, on your screen. Of the towers on the top, Micklegate Bar. The statues are a Victorian addition, by the way, in case you're wondering about that. The uh, Victorians rebuilt the walls. They were in a very bad state. Once they decided they were going to keep the walls, they, uh, they rebuilt them and they had a few flourishes. So we've got various statues and certain embellishments that wouldn't have been there at the medieval time. Because what was famous for many, many centuries here in York was the display of heads on the top of Micklegate Bar. It was a place where traitors' heads were displayed, and traitors, of course, of those who have acted against the interests of the monarchy. So consequently, it's not a poor man's crime. In the vast majority of cases, what you're going to find is that traitors are aristocrats, because either they've been involved in plots, in the seized power, or they've kind of raised armies, or whatever it may be that they've done. Generally speaking, these are earls and dukes and noblemen, noble women, that are found guilty of treason, of high treason, crimes against the king, the queen, the monarch of the day. And of course, famously, the punishment for this was to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Very, very brutal punishment, which very lengthy, but it involves being hanged until you are nearly dead. Not quite dead, but almost suffocated, being taken down, drawn on the back of a horse, and then arriving at the scaffold, being eviscerated, having your intestines removed, the man being castrated, and your bowels removed and placed on a fire, and burned next to you. Finally, the excuse's axe would remove your head, chop your body into four quarters. The head will be placed upon Micklegate Bar, and the other quarters will be sent to lesser towns and cities across the north. So, a very powerful and kind of potent symbol of do not mess with the power of royal authority, lest you fancy being hung, drawn, and quartered. So, one of the nastiest sort of form of punishment we've ever really kind of come up against, um, and invented that grand history of of dis sheer disple you know, unpleasantness, as you might say hung, drawn and quartered, you know, right up there. Um, but of course what it did mean is that for the people living in York, they had heads above them, quite literally heads. And so, you know, not particularly pleasant, it has to be said. The, uh, the crest, by the way, of King Henry VII, just on this side here, just hoving into view there. I'm just gonna put this down so we can just get through this archway. 
So the Michael Gate Bar has been various things over the years. The building inside now is a museum. It used to be a police station, a residence. Lovely old door there with a... Let these guys come through. No problem at all. So it's quite busy. I was thinking the walls might be fairly quiet today with the, with the weather, but uh, we've not been blessed with that. Thanks. So back out onto the walls. So all the side of the Gate Bar now. And uh, just put my umbrella. So you see, sort of coming through into Micklegate, so there's a great street, the route down into the centre of York, the bottom crossing the river, entering the city. And, uh, and so this is the route where just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and Charles, Queen Camilla, were just there, where you're looking at. And uh, the Queen was last here in 2012, Queen Elizabeth, late Queen Elizabeth. So in 2012, she came to the gateways. And there's a quaint little tradition whereby the king, the monarch, was asked the permission of the Lord Mayor of York to enter into the city. And tradi tradition dictates that the first time of asking, the Lord Mayor would say no. In reflection of York's independence, it is a chartered independent city and county, which is about York as being in Yorkshire, but actually it's York and the county of Yorkshire Historically, it wasn't in the county. It was kind of a separate entity. But uh, then on the second time of asking, it is then courtesy to allow the monarch to enter unhindered. And thereafter, once they have the permission of the freedom of the city, they don't need to arrive in the same way. So when, when King Charles came to do the, um, the Maundy ceremony, Easter, the distribution of funds to a chosen set of pensioners, he didn't arrive via the uh, by, by Gate Bar. He came in a limousine and was driven into the city. Um, so that protocol had already been established. By entering once on the royal entrance, he being given, in effect, the freedom of the city for his lifetime. So he no, no, no longer needs to come and knock at the front door. He can come and go as he pleases. And hopefully we'll see him again here very soon. Because York is most definitely what you would call a royal city. And um, I don't know if we can see much, by the way. Today you think you'd be more sort of a bunting and flags around but uh, perhaps that's more in the city centre we're not really going to skirt into the city centre so much today but uh, coming up in front of us is your first sign of the railway station and railways were incredibly important to York so we've talked about the location as to why it was that York was so important with its access points to the east coast to the sea but also being roughly halfway in between London and Edinburgh York was always very well placed on the transport hubs. Very, very many coaches would depart up and down to London, to Scotland from here. And so it's inevitable when the railways came that York was to be part of the railway story. And the station that's kind of coming into view now in front of you is actually the second station. The first station was, uh, was located actually inside the walls. So I'm going to show you the building of the first station in a moment as we go by. Um, but if you just look down here, okay, over the railings, if you can see the, the ground level where that where the car is, um, you can see that the, the, the next level is a few feet up. The grey going across your, your screen, so you can stripe. That's actually part of the old platform of where the station used to be. So the first station was actually inside the walls, which presumably the Victorians felt like a good idea, so where we put the station. But actually it wasn't terribly practical. What it meant was that trains could come in, but they have to reverse back out again. And it soon became clear that this wasn't a good solution for York. What you wanted was a through station. So a through station that was a long one. So when this station was built here and opened in 1873, it was the oldest, sorry, the oldest, the largest station anywhere in the world. So again, reflecting York's kind of gravitas, importance, this was the largest station in the world, which is uh, which is fantastic, a great accolade. You can only imagine the pride of the station master being given the keys to the largest station in the world. But the station master, we're told, they opened in the eighteen seventies, was a man full of his own self-importance, we might say. And so, when he heard that Queen Victoria was going to be passing through York en route to Balmoral in 1874, he couldn't resist the opportunity 
to have himself photographed with the Queen, the Empress of India. Unfortunately, the Queen by this stage was notoriously reserved. She'd been in mourning for her husband Albert for over 15 years, was rarely seen in public at this stage, and had no interest whatsoever in being photographed. And she sent ahead instructions there should be no fuss whatsoever. She was simply stopping in York overnight, and the following day she'd go off to Balmoral in Scotland for annual holidays. But uh, whether the message didn't get through or the station mark decided that it didn't matter, it'd be fine. He decided to have the city band, so brass band, children, flag wavers, flags, you name it, the full show to greet a monarch. So when the station master signal was told the royal train was about to arrive, the brass band struck up, the children began to sing, and cheer, everyone clapped and waved, and prepared to greet the arrival of the monarch. So as the royal train pulled slowly in to the platform, Queen Victoria cast an eye out. It was clear that her instructions had been disregarded and there was an official greeting party. She sent a message out to say she wasn't leaving the station until the platform had been cleared. She was uh, refusing to engage in any way with uh, the people that were uh, on the platform. So we can only kind of imagine the, uh, the atmosphere as the brass band told to stop playing, the children to clear the space, leave the flags, disappear, and obviously a very disconsolate station master eventually faced an empty platform. At that stage, Queen Victoria, it said, who quite clearly was not amused, disembarked from the train. She walked probably about 20 feet, I'll show you the walk in just a moment, and entered the hotel that you're looking at here, which was the Royal Station Hotel here at York. And um, she stayed there overnight. And then, in the morning, she made the same short walk onto a train, left for Balmoral, and never visited York ever again during her reign. She was so displeased. So you can see there, the Royal Entrance right in the middle. We can see the police uh, wagon. It was from there, basically, about 20 or 30 yards to the entrance of the hotel, was the entirety of her time in York. She never came again. But nonetheless, it was sufficient to give the hotel the name Royal. And for many, many years, it was at the Royal York Hotel. It's now got an alternative name, which I think is a shame. But growing up, it was always either the Station Hotel, the Royal York, but that hotel there, it's not a hotel, obviously. That's where Queen Victoria stayed in 1874. As I say, she's clearly not amused. Now, this is the building here. It is now on the right-hand side. The council officers, west officers, as they're called, is um, the York Council headquarters. But it is the site of the former station. And you can see, I think, with the building at the back there, with the cycle sheds, you can kind of see the kind of railway architecture going on. Much of the rear section is rebuilt, it's quite modern, but the front section of this row of the building is the original Victorian station. So I say, the first station of York was built inside the city walls, but uh, as I say, it was realized very, very quickly, it was in the wrong location. But York's links to the railway were incredibly well embedded. This beautiful building coming up in your picture now, it's the former headquarters, the North Eastern Railway Company, founded by George Hudson. And it looks like a Baroque palace. Such is the, the splendor and the extravagance of its building that uh, it's an echo of the wealth and importance of this company. GNAR, as it became known. So founded originally by George Hudson, who was mayor of York, four separate occasions ended up his career in financial scandal basically um, being a bit uh, economical with the truth to his investors about the sort of returns they could expect from some of these kind of railway investments so he was disgraced never again lord mayor bankrupted um, 
And it took a hundred years for him to be uh, forgiven, as you might say, because now actually he's got a street named after him. The street in front of us, to our right hand side, is George Hudson Street. And his portrait hangs inside the mansion house. So he's been kind of forgiven by the people of York, but it took a good hundred years. The statue over them, I'll just see by the bus, is of George Stevenson, his head engineer. Should have been George Hudson, because George Hudson was a naughty boy. He lost a statue as well. So it really was a spectacular fall from grace for the man who was known as the Railway King, who had uh, spotted very, very early on the uh, the potential for moving people, because railways, of course, were originally built to move coal. Coal had been largely transported by uh, by boats, by the sea. Rail, particularly locomotives, offered a much faster way of moving coal from the coal fields, Newcastle, Northern England, Durham, and so forth, to the industrial centres of the Midlands and London. So the locomotives, the steam-powered locomotives, um, could dramatically speed up the, uh, it's now the Grand Hotel, by the way, the five-star Italian yacht. So um, this hugely speeded up the time um, of uh, getting the coal there. So of course that meant, you know, quicker transportation, more profits. So everyone did very, very well. But Hudson was also very, very clear that there was a potential to move people as well. So the focus very, very early, early on was just about moving freight, moving people. And this is where railways have a hugely transformative effect on the development of human society. Because for the first time, people can move with relative ease and at sort of speeds that connected up parts of this island in ways that simply hadn't been possible. In the middle part of the 18th century, London was a four day coach ride from York. A hundred years later, it was a five hour train journey. Of course, sorry, now that is less than two hours. But you can see the difference between five hours and four days. So it really does usher in the beginnings of the modern world, the arrival of the railways, the ability to move people and goods. The chocolate factories, of course, of York could suddenly move their goods in good condition, get them into the, the fancy stores. London, Harrods and Knightsbridge could now stock chocolates that simply would have got two bashed around on a four day dirty coach ride down to London. So it opened up all manner of possibilities for, for both people and for goods that went well beyond the original ideas of kind of moving coal from the coal fields to the industrial centres. So the railways really did kind of transform and they also gave York the beginnings of what has come to be the defining industries that it has of the late 20th century and now the 21st century, which of course is tourism. These days, York is not an industrial production city, it is a city that is largely trades on its looks, if we're being brutally honest. And um, so the, the city of York's economy is very much service orientated. From hotels so behind us here, the Malmaison on hotel, the pubs there, you see the maltings, sandwich bar, eateries, cafes, you name it, the city is geared up for entertainment. And of course, boat rides on the water, museums, and all manner of historical attractions are here uh, for people. So, um, sorry about that, let me just get down here. So of course what the trains, trains did was allowed people to come and visit York for the first time. And by happy coincidence, the time where railway travel became sort of possible for the first time coincided with what we would now call the emergence of the Romantics, of a fascination with the medieval era where people wanted to know about the stories of King Arthur, Guinevere, Robin Hood, Maid Marian, and uh, this kind of idea you know, of chivalry, of romance, uh, the, the Mort d'Arthur in The Lady of Shalott, and these kind of things that kind of defined this newfound fascination with the medieval. Because up until this point, the medieval had been seen as a kind of rather dirty, backwards time of superstition, plague, and death that was lesser in substance than either antiquity or the age of reason and science that we kind of emerged into. We left behind blind faith and we now align science and knowledge to rule the world rather than kind of doctrine. So consequently, this was, you know, a, a, a quite a startling dramatic change that suddenly we'll, people were looking to this period of the medieval and finding beauty. But of course, once this became fashionable, 
it was very, very easy to come to York and imagine that you were on the set where King Arthur or Robin Hood may well have played out his drama. And so it became incredibly fashionable to the Romantics. And they came and discovered its medieval heritage, its beauty, and of course, its little quirk. So this is Barker Tower. The Barker Tower, the wonderful Perky Peacock Cafe, some of you may have visited, and its neighbour opposite, Lendl Tower, were again another pair of towers that had changed running through the river, this time as a customs point, with York being a very important trading centre. What was incredibly important, of course, the ability to, to collect taxes, impose duties upon the goods coming in and leaving the city. So actually, this was a customs point, and if you can, just as we sort of walk up to this, you maybe see there's like a sort of small section of leaded roof about a third of the way up. This is actually the site of the original tower. It was then rebuilt in the 15th century to include the levels above because it was also a ferry point. And this bridge didn't exist. And so um, the ferry existed and moved people from one side of the river to the other. And of course, with a ferry, you can earn a lot of money, enough to build this rather marvellous house. So that's the original tower there. If you look at the sort of bottom sort of left-hand corner, that, that roof, that was the original tower and would have very much mirrored Barker Tower over here. So as much as the money and the wealth that was made from the ferry, they were to build this rather splendid house themselves, which I think is, a, is quite magnificent. So um, we shot down there, down the river towards um, the bridge there. And uh, so this is where we end our tour in. Um, and the story that I like to kind of talk about to finish this tour is relates to the railway because that we're looking at there is a railway bridge, Scarborough Bridge. And um, when they were building that bridge in the latter part of the 19th century, they discovered that there was um, remains, archaeological remains of an Iron Age settlement. That the story of York being founded by the Romans in AD 71 is only partially true. In as yes, they founded a fort here but there have been human settlement in this area a good 10,000 years longer than that. So we think about 10, 12,000 years ago, people were living on the left-hand bank of the riverside here, an Iron Age settlement, a community of people that fished, and what they found when they excavated was lots and lots of evidence of, um, of fishing, but also of hunting, antlers and hooves, but not necessarily the sort of animals you'd expect. These animals were reindeer, moose, elk, wild boar, animals that had come across the ice bridge, which connected mainland Europe to Britain during the last ice age, but had then been trapped. The ice age began to thaw about 12,000 years ago. There was suddenly a great melt. And of course, what that meant was there was no way back. The animals were trapped on the island. The hunting commenced. And what we know about Iron Age villages is that they were traditionally by waterside, access to water and fisheries. At about half a mile or so upstream, there would be a clearing in the woods. This would attract the animals to a watering hole. And then by cooperation, by people coming together, they could hunt and successfully capture the food to eat. So the first sort of if you like, ideas of human cooperation is in hunting together, so human society. So that's what we know is happening here on this side of the river, somewhere between 10 and 12,000 years ago. So our story of York, we often say it covers 2,000 years, actually it's probably about 10 or 12,000 years, but uh, we like this 2,000 years bit, people sort of stick with that. It's long enough and it's certainly important enough. For 2,000 years, it was the capital of the north. It still has this as a titular title. We have a Lord Mayor of York, as is London. We have an Archbishop of York, only one of two in the country, both of whom present today at the coronation. So I think it does go to show that, you know, York's historic legacy and links to royalty do live on. But of course, things change. York is not the economic powerhouse that it once was. It is a, a relatively prosperous city, but often seen as a dormitory for people that earn their money elsewhere, can live here, have a nice life, but um, the wages in York aren't particularly fantastic. So I'm going to finish up the tour. I, I don't know who and how many are still on. 
um, because I've been unable to obviously chat to you. I think it's only 53. So um, I'm hoping that when I see this, it'll have been good video and audio. Um, I've got a feeling because people have, have dropped off, there might be audio issues because I'm using an external microphone. I need to examine those and find out what I've done with the chat. But uh, so if it's been a silent tour, then I will uh, I'll probably just take the video footage and use it at home. I'll rate over it and we'll use it that way. But uh, hopefully, for those that have been on, the frustration of not being able to, to read the chat or contribute to the chat or ask questions um, has been somewhat allayed by a, a rather nice walk of the walls, some good stories, and, uh, and time in one another's company. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to say goodbye from York and uh, hope to see you all very, very soon. So thank you and bye-bye.